Sometimes I feel like I've played every video game that will ever be made, and that the industry is just stuck in this cyclical loop of comfortably numb, profitable mediocrity, and I wonder if that's how the creative staff at Nintendo feel when they start making a game. Nintendo has always prided themselves on being an innovator and a pioneer, for better and for worse. On the one hand, this mentality led to series like Star Fox and F-Zero being stuck in limbo for decades because they'd prefer not to simply up the ante of what's already been done like the fans probably want, but instead to figure out some way of creating something entirely new on that basis. If F-Zero was owned by any other company, we would be on F-Zero GXZ Alpha Squared by now. This also led to games like Paper Mario Sticker Star, which were such dramatic and baffling deviations from the previous titles and weren't even particularly good on their own terms, at least I think. But that's the thing about experimentation, you have to recognize that not every weird thing is gonna work, and on the flip side, incredible games like Pikmin would probably never exist outside of that context. Could you imagine pitching Pikmin to an Xbox executive? He'd probably eat your fingers. I mean, these are the same guys who openly admitted to passing on GTA 3. That creative spirit has kept Nintendo relevant for 40 years, you know? It seems that only Nintendo makes Nintendo games, and I think Echoes of Wisdom is a prime example. Nintendo kinda has the spirit of an indie developer married to the budget and resources of a quad A developer, so there isn't really any restraint with respect to how they can make their games. I don't think it's so much that their ideas are tremendous and extravagant in scope as much as it is that they can give the little things all the attention and time that they need. Don't get me wrong, there are still games that come out today that are not made by Nintendo that I really, really enjoy, but it's rare that they surprise me in the way that something like Echoes of Wisdom does. The AAA video game industry is very superficial, not so different from Hollywood, really. There is so much trend chasing, so much market focus testing, and so much energy spent on surface level bullshit that at this point, they should be paying me to care about it. You'll still see games and hardware manufacturers push graphical fidelity and teraflops like it's the most important thing in the world, and I feel like it's been that way for at least as long as I've been following the industry. But we're now deep into the era of diminishing returns. You can tell the difference between a game running on PS4 and a remastered version on PS5 Pro, which is like 15 times more powerful. But those improvements are clearly becoming more and more marginal, and it's gotten to the point where I don't even care anymore. Switch isn't half as powerful as an Xbox One, which was universally panned as an underpowered piece of crap and came out four years before the Switch. Games are having to run at 500p just to keep it from exploding, and still, this crappy little bitch console is just dancing on them. Nintendo's secret weapon has never been that much of a secret, and that secret, of course, is their own creative output. A lot of the time, especially now, there isn't a whole lot like it on other platforms because they spend so much time on the tech that they routinely forget the most obvious answer which is hiding directly under their noses. Just give me a fun video game. They forget this so frequently that when Sony put out Astro Bot, everyone lost their collective shit. They were like, a fun video game? I've never seen anything like it. I still haven't played it, and even I can tell it's good, because it reminds me of Mario. What's the video about again? Zelda has been second only to Mario as Nintendo's most celebrated franchise, and much like 3D Mario, every game is usually inventive and unique enough from its predecessors that none of them are made technically obsolete, because they offer something different. It's clearly been getting trickier for them to do that with every single game, which was the justification for Breath of the Wild's approach. But with this one, they're going back to the old spaghetti with that top-down perspective. So how? How do they make that fresh? The premise of Echoes of Wisdom is that this time, Link is captured and Zelda is the protagonist of her own game that has her own name on it for the first, second time in history. Her weapon of choice is the Tri Wand that can create echoes of objects and enemies found around the game's world. This is one of those uniquely Nintendo ideas in that if you were to explain it to somebody without any kind of visual context, you'd probably sound like a dumbass, but once you actually see it in action and play it for yourself, you're like, ah, right, of course, she can spawn a fish and use it as a platform. Where did I lose you, honey? 
Nobody asked for this game. Nobody wanted this game. Not a single Zelda fan lay awake at night wondering why there wasn't a Zelda game where you could spawn boxes and trees on top of each other. This is just a dumbass idea that Nintendo came up with themselves because they just understand fun. Before even making the game, they could see in their mind's eye just how fun it could be. It ends up being a very engaging mechanic too, especially for traversal. Even though you can upgrade the number of items you can place over time, it really engages the player from the beginning to think of creative setups just to build an ad hoc staircase basically, to get up to a little island to grab a piece of heart or something. I thought it might get old after a while, but no. Even into the later stages of the game, it still manages to be very engaging. Soon you unlock other abilities like grabbing onto things to move them, or you can follow their movement. I think Nintendo can be really good at confident, self-evident game design. They're good at not boring the player with mentally exhausting tutorials every time a new mechanic is introduced, and instead developing games that efficiently explain themselves just by letting the player off the leash. Well actually, Tears of the Kingdom had a pretty shitty start. By the time I got off this island, I was almost ready to die in real life. In the old school Zelda games, every single dungeon usually provided a really fun toy to mess around with, like they'd introduce the hookshot and give you a bunch of opportunities to play with it before using it in the boss fight or something like that. This game's version of that is that every area and dungeon has new enemies and set pieces for you to capture and deploy elsewhere. There is very little restraint on the game's part with respect to how this mechanic is applied. If you have a stupid idea, you can probably make it work. You can deploy an army of little bastard enemies to wear down this ginormous Hitler's top guy type dude, and then you can deploy him later when you finally have enough tri power. This guy is awesome, he can just fight the bosses for you while you sleep in a bed and wait for your health to come back. The bed is also really cool, whenever I had to take a piss I'd just spawn a bed and by the time I came back all my hearts were maxed out again. The influence of Breath of the Wild can be felt strongly here, even though it's a top-down, old-school Zelda title. Open-world games are often contradictory in their design. They're marketed on freedom, but they often end up being very strict and prohibitive in how you're expected to approach the individual challenges. Breath of the Wild definitely wasn't the first open-world game to be this open to experimentation, but I think it did it exceptionally well, and they've translated that freedom to the top-down formula very effectively. The game is more than happy to indulge the player's creativity and experimental mind. Mechanics and set pieces interact with each other in bizarre ways that might surprise you, and it's quite remarkable how rarely the game says no to the player. I remember this one puzzle where I had to light these torches through these grates, and I was like, alright, what if I spawn a fire guy on top of this table and shoot an arrow through him so it catches fire, and boosh, it works. And that's just the kind of stuff that I thought up. I really am curious to see speedruns of this game. This is the kind of game where the people who will be really good at it will look like post-humanoid alien hybrids to the rest of us. While I don't consider the older 3D Zelda game design to be bad, it was very refreshing to be able to apply yourself in the ways that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom allowed you to. I didn't think they'd be able to apply that same principle to the top-down Zelda format, and I was very happy to be proven wrong. Fans of Link to the Past will recognize the game's overworld pretty quickly, and as somebody who recently beat that game for the first time this year, it's extremely cathartic to be able to just completely shit all over it by using a trampoline to jump over walls and walk on top of trees. I kind of assumed that the trees would just be a regular video gamey out of bounds area, but once I recognized that the game actually just lets you conquer the terrain like this, it was incredible. And that was the exact moment that the entire game clicked for me. Although it is technically a recycled map, there are a lot of new and dramatically overhauled areas to the point that it doesn't feel like it at all. It never loses that sense of discovery either, and because there's usually a solution as long as you're smart enough about it, it's very rare that you'll see something that you can't get yet because you don't have the right item at the time. Then there are the stealth sections. Now depending on what kind of echoes you have during these parts, you can absolutely destroy them with very little effort whatsoever. I love this Gerudo Fortress mission where the guard asks you to infiltrate this room to test the efficacy of their security and when you win, she's like, damn, I guess it's not as secure as I thought. And it's like, well how the hell were you supposed to know that I could just spawn literal water in the air and swim through it like Minecraft? 
That's a very obvious downside to this type of design. Once you get the right tools, the game becomes often very easy, except for this one slumber challenge mission that's impossible. By the end of the game, there are entire sections of levels that can just be disrespectfully circumvented by doing shit like this. It's dumb, but it's really funny though. Nintendo's recent history is proof that games don't need to be difficult to be fun, but if you want to turn it up, they did add a hero mode, which you can switch on and off at any time. But if you load it up on dank egg smoothies, you'll probably be alright. There's no way that tastes good. In terms of presentation, what can I say? The art direction takes after the Link's Awakening remake, which is already extremely pretty. Sparkling water, vibrant color palettes, expressive animations, it's what you come to expect from Nintendo at their peak performance. No ray tracing, no quantum alias Nitro Terra ambient polygonal refraction, but it's still very pleasing to the eye. I mean, it's birds in the sky, trees in between. Grubs in the ground, it was so serene. The sky was blue and the grass is green, and that's three square meals if you know what I mean. It does have performance issues that'll hopefully be fixed when the Switch 2 comes out, but for now you just gotta roll with it because they killed all the emulators with a rock. There are some pleasant tunes to listen to throughout the game, but honestly, I was just happy to hear the old horse race tune. Everybody sing it with me. Riding on the motherfucking horse right now. Riding on the motherfucking horse. For me, the weak link with this game was definitely the story and dialogue. Ever since Breath of the Wild, my idea of Zelda stories being epic, engaging, important pieces of the Zelda puzzle has largely dissipated. This was further solidified when Tears of the Kingdom came out. They were pushing the story as being darker than Majora's Mask or whatever. I really didn't see it. If you ask me what my favorite story moment from Ocarina is, I'll point to the cutscenes with Sheik with all that deep philosophical shit going on. Twilight Princess, you got Midna's Hour of Need, or Skyward Sword, basically any part with Groose in it. If you were to ask my favorite part of Tears of the Kingdom or Echoes of Wisdom story, I'd be like, Yeah, I like the part where the dialogue box ends and the characters shut the fuck up. For me, it is now the most underwhelming aspect of these games. Even in something like shit-ass Paper Mario Sticker Star, at least the dialogue is funny sometimes so I can laugh at it. You know, there's an undeniable entertainment value there. Whenever I try to pay attention to the dialogue in a Zelda game now, I just feel like a moron, like I wasted my time. If this is your first time experiencing a Zelda story, you might have been trying to gaslight yourself into believing it's way deeper and more engaging than it actually is, out of some misplaced sense of obligation. But as somebody who has played all of these games, rest assured that you really don't have to do that. The one who has torn this land aside. Sorry, let me just skip ahead of that. Thank you. There are some really nice side quests to keep things fresh, but there's also a lot of telephone where you're basically just carrying messages between people like a fucking owl. For me, the best side quests were the ones with Dan Pei, where he makes you kill a robot chimeras by mixing animals with special weapons and items. These things are an abomination to life but they are badass when they actually work. Echoes of Wisdom isn't the most extravagant and prestigious Zelda game, but I had a lot of fun with it. It's a rewarding game to mess around with to figure out what works or even just to amuse yourself. It's a satisfying potential answer to the thought experiment of what would the Breath of the Wild formula look like if it was in a top-down Zelda game. It's also a nice reminder of Nintendo's whimsical creativity that keeps them relevant in the face of an increasingly superficial industry. Maybe the next Zelda will let you use a gun. Now that's creative. 